Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second installment of uh, these H. Civ War author interviews. My name is Dr. Holly Pinheiro, currently an assistant professor at Augusta University. And I have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Alice Baumgartner, who is an assistant professor of history at the University of Southern California. She is the author of, just so you all can see this book, which you need to buy and read and cite, um, her first book is called South to Freedom, Runaway Slaves to Mexico and the Road to Civil War, which was published by Basic Books in 2020. Uh, she has been named, uh, it has been named, sorry, uh, the New York Times Editor's Choice. It was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Award and the Gilder Lerman Lincoln Book Prize. So basically, it's really good. Um, <laughs> So I now have the privilege of talking with her more in depth about this project to raise more awareness, um, but just really to have a fun conversation. So the first uh, question that I have um, is, what archives did you use for this project? And what were any of the challenges that you experienced while you conduct this? Well, thanks so much for that question and thanks for having me. I did research in 28 different archives in three different countries and working in archives particularly in mexico and the southern states presented unique challenges of which i was completely unaware when i started this project i first came to this project by accident in the summer of 2012 when i was doing research in northeastern mexico on a completely different topic about violence on the US-Mexico border in the mid 19th century. And as I was looking for any episodes of violent clashes along the border, I kept coming across kidnappers from the United States crossing into Mexico to attempt to recover freedom seekers and facing really unexpected resistance, unexpected to me, resistance from the freedom seekers themselves as well as Mexican officials. Uh, so. I was really, really surprised to come across these documents because I had no idea that Mexican officials and citizens would sometimes risk their lives to protect freedom seekers. And I really didn't even know that enslaved people were escaping to Mexico, but I was really curious. And so the next summer I went back to Mexico and I asked the archivists who are so helpful and so essential to the work that we do as historians to point me in the right direction. Right. And they, to a T in Mexico said, we don't have anything like that. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is that in Mexico, after 1821, the government had abolished all distinctions of caste and class. And of course, that didn't mean that those distinctions stopped mattering, that racism didn't exist. Right. But it did mean that censuses, government documents, didn't include information about someone's race, much less whether or not they were an escaped slave from the United States. And so it was really pretty hard to reconstruct that story. Mm -hmm. I had to go off other leads and with the help of those archivists continued to look at other violent encounters continued to look for sources that were based in regions and towns where i knew enslaved people were escaping and so i had to kind of get at the story in a different sort of way because race both for the reasons having to do with with your document production at the time right um just didn't really like i never found a, an entire collection that was about enslaved people or about runaway mm. slaves in mexico as you might find in archives in the united states the other major problem i encountered was really specific to archives in the southern states particularly in texas and louisiana and the main problem was that those archives were painting a very different story about the promise of freedom in Mexico than the Mexican sources. And in Mexico, I was really finding that enslaved people were able to secure a measure of freedom and political belonging. Mm -hmm. But sources in Texas and Louisiana, Louisiana were really disparaging the promise of freedom in Mexico. And in particular, they were arguing, they were saying that enslaved people who had escaped to Mexico were returning to the South to their former enslavers because the promise of freedom in Mexico 
proved to be empty. And I want to just give one example of this to kind of show why this was hard to deal with. In 1858, there was an enslaved man named Albert who had escaped to Mexico two years earlier in 1856 and then returned to a plantation outside of Matagorda where he had been previously enslaved. Mm -hmm. And Texas newspapers were ecstatic about this and they printed article after article talking about how Albert had grown tired of uh, the poverty in Mexico and the coercive labor systems in Mexico. And while we can say that that gloss on Albert's motivations was no doubt imbued by, affected by the paternalistic racist uh, assumptions of those newspaper editors, the evidence really did seem to suggest that Albert had returned from Mexico. And it raised this question of why would he do that if what I was finding in Mexico was true. Mm -hmm. And by returning to the Mexican archives, by turning as well to some oral history sources, I was able to find that Albert Gordon did indeed return, mm -hmm. but he escaped several months later, this time with his brothers, Henry right. and Isaac. Right. He was doing what Harriet Tubman did. Right. And it, it was a challenge to try to make sense of these conflicting stories and these two, or in these, these archives produced in two different countries, two different, um, uh, two different sets of archives. Mm -hmm. um, but by doing that, I think we got, I hope that I was able to tell a more complete, a, a more, um, a truer story of what was going on in this region. And then finally, this is a very basic point, but when working in so many different archives, right. it was actually really hard just to keep track of all of my notes. And I talked to a lot of different historians about how they organized their notes, truly betraying that I should have been a librarian probably rather than a historian. <laughs> but I really owe a huge thank you to Cameron Blevins, who's now at CU Denver, who's right. Uh, blog posts about how he organizes his notes on Evernote were so helpful to mm -hmm. me in figuring out how to do this, that I moved from taking all my notes in a single word document to having a much, much more easy to navigate system going forward. I mean, I think you're, you hit on so many important points for students and scholars on particularly, let's say graduate and undergraduate students doing research maybe for the first time, uh, particularly of something that they've never had much training on. I know for me, I used to just put all my notes out on the floor and try to organize them by some theme, right? But even then still, it was just this massive array of documents. Yeah, I did that floor. too. Like I wrote it down on note cards and I had stacks yes. and that was just very time consuming. It is and messy. Uh, and to yeah, be honest, when you have pets, it's also gonna be a train wreck at some point. Absolutely. So, um, but I think, um, you know, the organization of, of how we do the, you know, process the material and, and make sense of it is, is critical and it's a skill. Um, and, but you also bring up the, the important role that archivists play in what we do. Uh, I talk to my students who are looking at potential career paths and, you know, I say, if, if you're going to be an archivist and you are, you are critical in, in disseminating information and knowledge, but for those who want to conduct research, um, whether it's a graduate student, professor, or even just someone that's doing a genealogical history, you need to know and be very nice to the archivist because they have all the records and they know what's there, what's cataloged, what's not. And most times if, you know, in my luck anyway, they've been very helpful and I've been able to find stuff that I didn't realize was even there because, you know, I asked questions like, how are you doing? You know, you know, like these kinds of to yeah. get to know them. And then I, you know, it, it had some benefits other than yeah. you know, just being a nice person. Yeah, uh, I almost I, think that the book should have my name and then all of them. <laughs> yeah. Yes, archivists, uh, I mean, just music. There's so many different people that are important to the process of making uh, the research that we do possible and accessible that I think they don't get enough credit uh, without question. I, I think what your book also, as you highlight, when you talk about uh, the cultural citizenship, like as I read through it, I was thinking of, as I just recently taught, uh, Troubled Refuge, uh, Shane Germaning, that book is changed my life as a scholar um, and even just how I see the world in many ways. Um, but also when you talked about Albert's phenomenal story and that, that movement and the, the way in which he navigates freedom and returning to bondage with the ultimate end game of being free for himself and others, I see that as aligning with uh, Stephen Kandrovitz and Stephen Hahn, you know, with, with the free movement as a political act. And so I think that there, this furthers on just like how we can use different scholars theories and, and approaches to, to build upon because your work is in conversation with them 
and many others. It's just what I think your book does exceptional well is, is we need to make sure we recognize that they're going to Mexico for freedom, uh, which is what we're going to continue to talk about with these conversations.